we've got this saying. There's the arrogance of power. With punk, we had the power of arrogance. You know, for me, punk was an art provocation. Hip hop totally was a provocation. Grit, grit, grit. Suddenly I'm like wandering around the streets of New York. I think they were building a high rise or something. There was this thing just going down. And I was hearing that at the same time I was hearing pumpkin. And I was just going to Adrian, I was going, this is fucking, this is fucking brilliant. You know, I, I remember hearing, you know, the, the first set of stuff coming out of New York when they were scratching and looping up things and, you know, Nena Cherry, Mark Stewart and Ari Up were saying to me, I'll oh, check this, check this. I luckily enough got to go over there very early on. And I met a lot of the people who were involved there, like Double D and Steinsky, Latin Rascals, Arthur Baker, Tommy Boyd, and I was watching those people. We were playing in front of 500,000 people in the middle of Trafalgar Square, and uh, I wanted to think of a song everybody knew that would, like a We Shall Overcome, that will appeal to everybody in the audience, young and old, right? So I was beginning to think of how to mash up Jerusalem. Bring me my with, with double cassette decks, noise generators, turntables, and a few of these AMS things and kind of dub techniques and all this weird like experimental shit. I started having this idea. Spoken word, bound sound, bricolage, montage, brass band, just madness, full on madness. We cut the rhythm and then Mark had the music. We had to keep speeding up and naturally fast to make it fit. Tape to tape to tape, speed up, speed up, more, faster, faster. Record, record. Underneath is a funky, tough foundation. That's the only reason we can ghost out and dub it to fuck later on, because there's something tight as hell underneath. Although we made it in, Lo in London, Learning to Cope with Cowardice was me kind of digesting the sights and sounds and the kind of internationalism that I'd experienced in New York. Well, Mark wanted to make that, not a hip-hop record or a funk record. He wanted to make kind of messed up reggae record. We were very influenced by On the Corner by Miles Davis and William Burroughs. Manipulating tape, mixing, cutting, 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 and then making collages out of that, then mixing that back to quartet, back to multi-track, overdubbing it. To this day, I've never done that much editing. We were actually scratching with the multi-tracks. We were holding the machine and making it backwards and forwards. 76 edits of separate bits of these noises going backwards and forwards, all stuck on the wall. We were cutting shit up, man. The only way we could sample at that stage was you'd have a little jack plug connected to an AMS, slightly out of the thing to get that bit. And while the kind of reggae rhythm was running, I would go Disrespecting the limits of so-called machines. Mark was always wanting to overload stuff and uh, make it bleed and get as trebly as it possibly could get. Take the snare so it was literally cutting your eyeball off. I was constantly fighting with engineers about buzzes and hisses and noises and trying to make helicopter sounds. And then they try and change it, they try and normalise you. I'm not going to be fucking normalised. As Smith and Mighty say, there's something about bass that's like being in the womb and the, and the throbbing of the blood and the, you know, it's immersive. For me it's more attitude, I think. Again, that arrogance or that, or the, the, that nerve is as important as the music to a certain extent. You can use these things as a kind of a, a stepping forward and speaking truth to power, which is, which is crucial. <laughs>